Every defining moment of my own life began with a struggle. And I think that you can attest to that in your own life as well. In dealing with those times and those situations and those struggles, I was forced to grow. You've been forced to grow. We've all been forced to grow. We've been forced to learn. We've, we've been forced to adjust in the way that we live. And if we face the struggle properly, and if we face it in the way that, that God wants us to, it will ultimately make us better. It will make us stronger, no matter how difficult it may be. Uh, defining moments are shaped by that struggle. The, the moments, you know, they're not the things that really, that really do that to us. But we talked about Jacob the first week. Jacob's struggles that were brought on by bad choices in his life. The next uh, Sunday we talked about struggles that were brought on by the actions of others. And we used Joseph as the biblical example of that. And then the last time I was with you, we talked about the Apostle Paul and, and the struggles that in his life were brought on by his obedience to Christ. And all the things that are connected, that were connected to that. And God uses those struggles to get us to where he wants us to be. God will use the struggles of our life to bring us in line with his will into the perfect will that he has for us and get us to the place in our life that he ultimately wants us to be in the very center of his will in our life. But on the other hand, Satan uses those same struggles to keep us from getting to where God wants us. And what happens a lot of times in our life is that we're struggling, we're going through something, but instead of embracing the struggle and embracing the lessons, we get mad at God because of the pain, because of the issues, and we begin to lash out at God, and, and, and we literally, literally void anything that God wants to do in our life. Now, does, can God handle the fact that we're mad at Him? Sure, He's got broad shoulders. He can handle it. It doesn't upset God when you get ticked off at him. Okay? It doesn't tick, you know, the, the thing about it is you need to understand this. If you stay in that anger long at your creator, then Satan wins in your life. Satan wins. And you will never find contentment. You'll never find peace. You'll never find joy. Notice I didn't say happiness. Because happiness... It's not about anything in the Christian's life. Oh, I just got to be happy. No. You have to have peace. You have to have joy. You have to have contentment. Happiness is something that happens inside of you. People all the time tell me, well, if I could just have this man, or if I can have this woman, or if I can have this job, I'll be happy. It has nothing to do with, with external realities. Happiness is a state of mind that happens inside. If you're not happy with yourself, you'll never be happy with anything else. You first have to be happy. Well, I want God to make me happy. Well, if you're a mean, nasty person, God's not going to do that. Okay? If you're always complaining about stuff, if you're always grumbling and complaining, you're always mad and always angry, that has nothing to do with God. That has everything to do with you and the reality that you're actually allowing the enemy to destroy God's fruit in your life. Because the fruit of the Spirit, we know, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, all of those kind of things. All right? Circumstances do not define us. They do not define us. The way we react to those circumstances will define us. And I said this in one of the earlier teachings, scars only show where we've been. They do not dictate where we're going. We all have scars. But the scars are about something that happened in the past. They do not have to determine where we're headed in the future. And it's not the healing in our life that sustains us. It's the process of getting there. And when it's all said and done, it really is about choices. It really is about choices. Now, when we talked about Paul the last time I was with you, um, I brought this great truth out. And this is, this is a great truth, that God will inconvenience you and I in order to help somebody else. I told you the story about our promise keepers trip and the bus and the way ultimately God saved a man because of the pain and stuff that we went through on that bus ride. But you look at Paul's life and you see the same thing. God inconveniences his children in order to help somebody else sometimes. Let me ask you something. If you have never been divorced, if you've never lost a child, if you've never gone through any kind of tragedy, do you have any paradigm in which to speak into somebody's life that's going through those situations? No, you haven't. You can't. 
Now, I'm not saying we should all go out and, and file for divorce this morning so that we can reach other people. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that there are situations in our life that better equip some for certain situations than others. I, I've never, I'm, and I get, I get in, 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 in Roman Catholicism, I get the whole, you know, the priest is married to the church and all that kind of stuff. But what I don't get is how that individual can talk to us about our marriages and the dynamics of marriage relationships, and I don't get how they can speak into lives about parenting. Because if you've never had a kid, the best thing you can do with someone, to someone who has is keep your mouth shut. And you know, I've been around here 30, 31 years, and I, and I was a youth pastor when I came here. I had an 11-month-old daughter when we came here, and I was telling a lot of you how to raise your teenagers, and I have apologized for the last 22 years for those, those, that, that advice. <laughs> I have apologized because I can tell you, I didn't know. I gave you some of the most ludicrous advice, and I didn't know it until Kristen got to be 12, 13 years old, and I went, oh, my goodness. I've been telling people this for 12, 13 years, and then Cameron comes along. He is 12, 13 years old, and and now after raising, I used to know things. Now after raising two kids into, I don't know nothing. I don't know anything. You know, and it, it's, it's just those kind of scenarios and those kind of situations. But I do know this, that the secret to contentment in all situations is what Paul came to the realization. That is this, that it's not self-sufficiency, it's sufficiency in Christ. It's about depending on Him for every part of our life. Now today, you know, and this is not going to be your typical Father's Day message. I'm not even, I'm, you know, I've already said Happy Father's Day to the guys. I'm not going to deal with fathers today at all. I'm going to deal with God's people. Today, we're going to talk about one of the most complex individuals in Scripture. There's probably more been written about this man than anyone else in Scripture. Entire books have been written about this guy. His name is David. He's one of my favorite characters in all of Scripture. Um, He is a, a, um, well, I've already said he's complex, and that, that puts it mildly, to be honest with you. He is an ultimate example of what not to do. And what to do. He really is. And so we're going to look at him, and I'm going to give you David's life, 70 years of his life, in the next 20 minutes. God willing, and the creek don't rise. All right? Now, David had a lot of money. If you, to, to know about David, you've got to read First and Second Samuel. You've got to read First Kings and Second Kings. You've got to read First Chronicles and most of the Psalms. And that gives you David. Now, David had a whole lot of moments in his life, and if I were to ask you today, what would you say defines David? Most of us will say he killed Goliath, or others might say he was a man after God's own heart. But I submit to you this morning, and I believe that I'm going to show this to you biblically before we get finished today, that those are not the things that define King David. He did that. He killed Goliath when he was a kid. And yes, he was a man after God's own heart, but that is not the thing that defines David. So I want to look at his life Really quick today, you're going to feel like you're drinking from a fire hose for the next few minutes, but let me just kind of run this down, okay? I will say this, in all of history, in all of Israel's history, no one lived as large as David. No one. He was the youngest son of Jesse. His great-grandmother was Rahab, the harlot. If you remember back when when Israel was going into the promised land, she was the harlot, the prostitute that hid the spies. His grandmother was Ruth. He was a shepherd boy with his dad, Jesse, and, and, and Samuel went to his house. When God told Samuel that I've, I've taken my anointing off of King Saul, I want you to go to the house of Jesse, and I want you to anoint one of Jesse's sons. And Jesse's got these big strapping boys, and he parades everyone through, and the prophet goes, it's got to be this guy. And God says, no, it's not him, not him, not him, not him. They're all done. And he finally goes, Samuel looks at Jesse and says, do you not have any more kids? He goes, well, I got one more. But he's like the runt. And he's out taking care of the sheep. And, and, and Samuel looks at him and says, we are not going to sit down. We're not going to move from this spot until he gets here. And so they send for, da- for, for David. He comes into the courtyard there at his dad's house or in the front yard of his dad's house. I don't know if there was any trees there or not. But he walks up. He's been tending sheep. And there's this old guy with a beard. And he's, just, he's got a long and, and a stick and all this kind of stuff. And he's got this horn in his hand. And he... David walks up and the the old guy walks over and just starts pouring this oil on top of his head. Now, can you imagine? He's like eight or nine years old. This old guy all of a sudden just starts, opens a can of 30 weight and just starts pouring it all over your head. I mean, think about that. 
And he's sitting there going, what's, what's going on? You know, and the, and the prophet says some stuff over him, and, and, and then we see David doing what? He just goes right back to the sheep. I mean, it's one of those, it's the most non-spectacular, kingly anointings that you will ever see. I mean, you know, I mean, when, when uh, the, the English guy uh, with the new wife and new little babies, going to be the king after Elizabeth's gone. I can't even think of his name. There we go. Good grief. I told you I've been on vacation. I mean, they, that bells are going off when this kid's born and everything else. You know, everything's happening. Because, and it's all this pomp and circumstance. David just walked in the front yard. A guy pours oil over his head, and he goes right back to the sheep. David doesn't even realize what's going on. You know, he's too young. He does, it doesn't make any sense. But at some point, a little bit later on, the king begins to have some emotional issues. He has this spirit that keeps coming on him that is tormenting him. He doesn't sleep. He's, he's just, all this kind of stuff. It's an emotional breakdown. And so they send and they bring David to his court to play his banjo or something. I don't know. Harp. I'm a redneck. We don't play harps. I prefer the banjo. My story, I use the banjo. You can use the harp when you tell the story. But anyway, he comes before the king. When the, when the evil spirit that torments him comes on King Saul, David plays and sings and the spirit leaves. So David is in proximity to the king. He becomes, ultimately becomes one of Saul's armor bearers. When Saul goes into battle, David is carrying his armor, all this kind of stuff. One day when he's off, he's, tre- he's tending his sheep back at his dad's house, and his dad says, hey, your brothers are fighting over here. I need you to go over there and check on them, take some cheese and some bread to them, and just see how they're doing. When he walked into the camp, Goliath is on the battlefield yelling at the army. And, and, you know, David being a kid, he's, I don't, he's probably no more than 10 or 12 years old at this point, if he's that old. And so he sees Goliath, and he sees the army scared to death, and, and, and all of a sudden, David just hears people talking. So he, he says, what did you say is going to be given to the man that kills the giant? And they go on this long list of stuff. Your dad doesn't have to pay, your household doesn't pay taxes anymore. Now, that alone would be enough to say, well, let me think about this for just a minute. But then he goes, and he'll be given this. He said, and oh, by the way, he'll also be given one of the king's daughters. Now, that's a pretty good deal for a middle school kid. I mean, it's a pretty good deal. You know? And so, David says, I'll take care of him. I'll fight him. Nobody else will. I'll fight him. Now, we, 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 we look at this from a natural and go, okay, he's, he's too big for his britches. He's, you know, he's a little bit too, too cocky, too confident too arrogant, but he has a pedigree. He's, he's already, he says to the king, he said, look, I killed a lion, I killed a bear with my own hands. And, and, and lions and bears are, are stronger than men, and so this is just a big, tall man. I'm not afraid of him, I'll deal with him. God, te- God helped me here. God helped me here. God delivered me from the hand of the bear and, and, the, and the lion. He will deliver me from this Philistine. So he's making these statements. But Saul looks at him and says, well, you can't fight him. He's been a warrior all his life. You're just a kid. You know, that, that plays the harp, <laughs> the banjo. So he says, here, put on my, if you're going to do this, at least wear my armor. You've been toting it around, at least wear it. Well, he can't. It doesn't fit, doesn't work. One thing to carry is another entirely different thing to wear it on the battlefield. So David says, I don't need this. I'll just take my slingshot, go to the creek bank, picks up five stones. Uh, wine, nobody really knows, doesn't really matter. They only took one anyway, you know. I mean, there are a lot of people who go, I just need one shot. That's great. And I may only need one shot at times, but I always have four more in the chamber, in, in, the, in the magazine. It's always about insurance. Okay? And he walks out there, and he starts taunting the giant. You know, he's, yeah, all this kind of stuff, dancing out there, jumping behind the, you know, and, and then he just runs at him and hits him between the eyes with a, with a rock, knocks him down, takes his sword, 
takes the giant sword, chops off his head, and picks his head up and says, I did it. I did it. I can almost see my, my youngest grandson because that's one of his favorite terms. He'll, he'll do something on it because he, he's very independent. He wants to do it on his own. And every time he does, he goes, Papa, I did it. I did it, Papa. I can see David. I did it. All right? So, Saul asks a question. Who is this guy? Now, this might give us a little bit of picture of just how far emotionally and mentally off that Saul has become. Because not only has David been in his household playing the banjo and harp and, and everything else and singing, he's also been his armor bearer. But Saul literally asked after David kills the giant, who is this kid? Who is this kid? He becomes the captain of Saul's armies. Saul gives him his daughter Michael and they, and they get married. And Saul, as the captain of the army, he all of a sudden... David as the captain of Saul's armies David is having all these victories and all these wins and people begin to write songs and sing songs about David and they sing this one particular song that Saul hears Saul has slain his thousands but David his ten thousands and it upsets the crazy king because he's messed up and now he's jealous and so he decides I'm going to kill him and so he starts trying to kill David he pursues him for years years and I've tried, to, I've tried to figure out the timeline of David, of everything that went on in his life. And you have to understand, he, this guy, he's, he is married to the king's daughter in his early teenage years. I used to think it was in his late teens, but it's not. It's in his early teens. Because he becomes king over the entire nation at 30. And Saul pursues him for at least 15 years. So you think about, do the math and you look at it. I mean, it's just, it's just bizarre. David could have killed King Saul on multiple occasions, but he chose not to. David goes over to Philistia, the Philistines. He fights with him, does a lot of things, but he's ultimately given by the king of, he's ultimately given the city of Ziklag. And David becomes the king of Ziklag. Now David could have stopped right then and there because he's now king. He could have settled. Well, this is what the prophet said would happen to me. I am now king of my territory. I am now the king. I was anointed to be king. I am now king. The problem is that he wasn't to be king over Ziklag. He was to be king over Israel. Sometime later, Saul kills himself. David becomes king over Judah. He reigns over Judah for seven years. Then after Ishbosheth died, they come to David and they ask him to be king. And unite the kingdom of Israel. Not just no longer, no longer Judah and Israel. Now it's the entire king of Israel, kingdom of Israel. He's 30 years old and he's the king over all the United Kingdom. He reigns for 40 years. He captures, one of the first things he does is he captures a city called Jebus. And he renames it Jerusalem, the city of David. He brings the ark to Jerusalem. God promises David his house is to be established forever. If you want to see a wonderful prayer after God speaks to David and does this, read 2 Samuel 7 sometime this week. It's a beautiful prayer. I don't have time to read it this morning. David reigns. There's a point in his reign that he goes to Saul's household and says, anybody left in Saul's household? And there's only one descendant of Saul left, and that's Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is a young man who was dropped when he was a little baby. He was paralyzed. He couldn't walk. And he felt, he figured that he would, be, he would be an invalid for the rest of his life, living in obscurity. But David brings Mephibosheth into his household and puts his feet under the king's table. And he spends his entire rest of his life with his feet under the king's table. David does this for the son of his enemy. David has victory after victory after victory. One day he is not at war. It's hot, he walks up on the roof of his palace, he looks across the street, there's a lady taking a bath, he doesn't go back in and start playing ping pong or basketball, he continues to gaze at the woman, he begins, it moves from a gaze to lust, he brings her to himself, finds out who she is, knowing that she is the wife of one of his key generals, Uriah the Hittite, one of his mighty men. 
He has an affair with her. She gets pregnant. David kills her husband on the battlefield or has him killed. They lose their baby. Nathan shows up one day, the prophet shows up one day and tells him a story about a man who had many sheep and a man who had only one. But the man who had many took the one sheep from the guy that only had the one sheep. David gets incensed and he says, I will have him killed. And the prophet looked at him and said, David, you're the man. I like the way the King James says it. Thou art the man. The King James just has that in your face thing to it sometimes. Thou art the man. It's after that encounter that the child that, that Bathsheba was pregnant with dies. Later on, Amnon, one of his sons, sleeps with his half-sister Tamar, rapes her, actually. David doesn't do anything about it. Absalom, his, or his son, conspires against his father. David flees. There's a civil war in Israel. Absalom, after David flees Jerusalem, Absalom literally goes in and takes his father's concubines to the roof of the palace and rapes them in front of the entire nation over and over and over publicly. They're in battle. The father and son are in a civil war against each other. Absalom gets killed. David mourns to a point where his general has to come in and says, what are you doing? These men have fought for you valiantly. You have retaken the city. You are now back on the throne that you, that you established, but you're about to ruin this for your, kid, for your soldiers and for your kingdom. You don't wake up and smell what's going on. Yes, he's your son, and yes, it's a horrible thing, but he was going to kill you. So he gets his head screwed on straight. He comes back out. At some point later, David decides he wants to find out how many soldiers he's got. He numbers Israel. God told him not to do it. He does it anyway. There's a plague. He's given a choice of three judgments. He chooses the plague. Tens of thousands of people die. He amasses a huge amount of resources to build the temple of God in Jerusalem. He builds an, an altar at Aranah, the Jebusite. He wants to bring the ark back into, the, into Jerusalem. Getting closer to the end of his life, his other son, Adonijah, sets himself as, as king because David is on his deathbed. And in that story, the Bible says that David never inquired of his boys. He never asked his boys, why do you do the things that you do? And so when I tell you that, that David is this dichotomy, he's this... He's this the worst of the worst and the best of the best to one of these situations. He was a horrible dad. He was a horrible dad. He never disciplined his kids, never said anything to his kids, never even questioned their actions. They just did crazy, crazy things. David never asked, why are you doing And it goes all the way back to Amnon and Tamar. He never even asked. He never even had a conversation with Amnon about raping his sister. Never. But he's on his deathbed. He hears that Adonijah set himself up as king. Bathsheba comes in and said, you promised me that my son, Solomon, would be the king. And so David literally inserts Solomon as king. Minutes before he dies. The next thing we see after that is at age 70, David died. David lived 70 years total. But it would be, it would be the, the modern day equivalent of probably 120 years. He lived larger than any person in Israel's history. And depending on how he is viewed is an individual perception on people in Israel to this day. David had a lot of struggles. Some of them brought on by bad choices. Some by the actions of others. And some as a result of disobedience. You read through the book of Psalms and you get the picture of a guy who was emotionally in turmoil at times. High highs and low lows. But the thing that the overlying uh, or underlying thread that, that runs from his life, from his youth to his death, is that he was always bent toward God. He was always bent toward God. 
you know, we read through Samuel, both Samuels, and we read through the Kings, and we read through Chronicles, and we read Psalms, and we see that the Lord is with David. We see that David has humility. We see that, that David finds strength in the Lord his God. Over and over and over, you see these words. And so David inquired of the Lord. Over and over. And even in his failures, now listen, listen, David commits adultery and has the woman's husband murdered. Tries to cover it up by marrying his widow so that the math will work out right when the baby's born. I mean, this guy, this guy, as great as he was, had huge, huge seasons in his life that he just made a mess of stuff. But even in his failures, listen to this. Listen, this, this, just listen to this. Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Now I want you to listen to the emotion behind this. I mean, this is, this is getting to me this morning. I've read this 50 times in the last week. But I'm thinking about a man who is broken beyond broken. He's at a place in his life where he has nowhere to go. He's been confronted. Everything is out on the table. There's no hiding. He is naked before a nation. He's naked before God. But instead of getting angry and bitter, this is what he says. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. You see the urgency? He's begging. He's begging. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your way so that sinners will turn back to you. No one can speak into a situation better than someone who's lived it. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I will bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. Even in his failures, even in his failure, in his darkest moment, when there's nothing else that can be hidden, when everything that had been hidden is out in the open, David is broken to a point where he just speaks it out. He just speaks it out. It's raw. It's raw. There's some great lessons for us to learn in this, folks. And I could stop right here and I could preach for the next six weeks just out of Psalm 51. But even that is not what defines David. David, a man after God's own heart, yes. He lived larger than his mistakes, absolutely. So what is it that defines David? One word. Worship. Worship. He brought them the ark to Jerusalem. It took two trips, but he got it there. First trip was a disaster. David, in his zeal to bring the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of the Lord, into the, into the city of David, 
he was too exuberant, he was too excited, he didn't take the time to figure out exactly how we're supposed to do this. And so he just goes and builds a new cart, grabs some people, what's going to go get it and bring it back. It starts to move on the cart. One of the guys reaches up and touches it. God kills him on the spot. David gets mad at God. Sets it up in the barn of somebody there. And leaves it at Obed-Edom's house. There's a name for you. I can't understand what the mom would have been thinking. I'm going to name my kid Obed-Edom. Think about your name, and it could be worse. Time elapsed. David begins to hear reports of the blessings that have come upon Obed-Edom and his household. And David realizes something, that the manifest presence of God is there. And where the manifest presence of God is, there's always blessing. There's always blessings. And so he inquires. He does something different this time. He doesn't go in his zeal. He doesn't go in his exuberance. He doesn't go as a headstrong king. He steps back and he inquires of the Lord as to how it's supposed to be happened. He inquires of the, the priest how it's supposed to be. And he realizes that the priests are supposed to bring the Ark of the Covenant. It's supposed to be born on the shoulders of priests. So the second trip from Obed-Edom's house to Jerusalem is a vastly different situation. The ark is being carried, not on a cart. It's being carried on the shoulders of the priest. In 1 Chronicles 15 and 16, two chapters, I'm not going to read them in their entirety, but I'm going to hit some high points here. <clears throat> and yes, I've already missed my 20 minutes, so hang tight. He prepared, he prepared a place for the ark of God in the city of David, and he pitched a tent for it. Then he said, no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God because the Lord chose them to carry the ark and to minister before him forever. David assembled all of Israel in Jerusalem to bring the ark up to the place he had prepared. There are 896 Levites and priests that are part of this procession. 896. It was before, because you, he called to the Levites, he said, because you, the Levites, did not bring it up the first time that the Lord our God broke out in anger against us. We did not inquire of him about how to do it in the prescribed way. There's a whole teaching right there. I don't have time to do it this morning. So they consecrated themselves. David told the leaders to appoint their fellow Levites as musicians and make joyful sound and musical instruments, lyres, harps, and cymbals. No banjos, but we can wish. And then he said this in verse 22. Kenaniah, the head Levite, was in charge of the singing. Then it says this. That was his responsibility because he was skillful at it. Pastor Garrett, bring your team to the platform now, please, because you are skillful at what you're about to do. David, the elders of Israel, the commanders and units of thousands went out to bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with rejoicing. David had his linen robe on, but underneath his robe, just like the Levites, underneath the robe, he also had a linen ephod. Verse 28 there says, So all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouts, with sounds of ram's horns and trumpets and of cymbals and the playing of lyres and harps. All Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouts, with the sounding of ram's horns and trumpets and of cymbals and playing of lyres and harps. Now listen to me this morning. When God's presence is to be ushered into a place, it's always ushered in on the, on the shoulders of the priest. Okay? But you have to understand that with the coming of Jesus Christ, there's a shift the priest is not the pastor. Okay? The priests are anyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ because he has made us kings and priests unto him. When we come in here on Sunday morning, we come in here, when we start our services, we come in here first and foremost to usher in the presence of the Lord. It's not ushered in on the shoulders of the musicians. 
They're a part of it. They're leading a part of it. But the presence of God is ushered in on your shoulders, on my shoulders, on everybody in this room. We are priests unto God. We usher in the manifest presence of God when we come together here. David, and, and, and this thing is going on, there's shouts and there's sounding of horns and there's trumpets and there's cymbals and they're praying of lyres. And, and we don't have lyres, we got guitars. And we've got harps. And we got drums and we got cymbals and we got singers and we got all this stuff. David comes into the city of Jerusalem. One of his wives, Michael, she looks down and she sees him. And Michael's been given a bad rap. And I don't have time to go in this story. I'm just going to give it to you quickly. But here's the thing. We have given Michael a bad rap because she was mad at the way the king was dancing. But the truth of the matter is that she's been living as Pelkiel's wife for almost 20 years. She hasn't been with David since her daddy got after him. And Saul took Michael and gave him to gave her to another man. And she's been living as his, as his wife all this time. David now, he's just brought her back into Jerusalem. There's anger. There's, there's feelings of betrayal. There's all kind of stuff going on here. And we get mad at Michael because she's, she's not worshiping the way David worships. It's not about Michael. Never has been about Michael. It's about David. It's about the king understanding there's a right way to do this. And it's about the way it is done with the priest bringing the presence of God back into the city of David. Bringing the presence of God back into the nation of Israel. Setting it up in a place. You see, before it would go to Gibeah. The area of Hebron there where the ark of the tabernacle, the old tabernacle of Moses was set up. David doesn't bring the ark of the covenant back to the tabernacle. He brings it to Jerusalem. Sets it up in a special tent that is open to the public 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. The order of worship in Israel changes when David brings the ark into Jerusalem. What's happening here? We're getting a glimpse of Jesus. We're getting a glimpse of Jesus. What we're seeing in the Old Testament is a foreshadowing of what is to come. It's a foreshadowing of what's going on in 2016 in Niceville, Florida this morning. Because we're not bound by old tradition. We're not bound for, by going to a specific place where the old covenant was, but a new place where the veil has been torn from top to bottom. The, the, the thing is open. God is accessible to all of us and to anyone. And they brought it there. They set it up in the tent. Then David first appointed Asaph and his associates to give praise to the Lord in this manner. Now I want you to stand all over this room. Because the next few minutes of this service. He said, well, I'm hoping we're going to have altar workers down around front this morning. Look, they're going to be here around the front. But I'll be surprised if you need an altar worker after the way we're going to end this service. Because if we step into the arena where I believe we're supposed to step into this morning, and it's only going to take a few minutes, but something's going to happen in your life. Healings are going to take place. Blessing is going to come into your life. Restoration is going to come into your homes and into your marriages. God's going to do some stuff in your life in this house here today. He told him, praise the Lord in this manner. Now listen to, listen to the instructions. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. Remember the wonders that he has done. Sing to the Lord, verse 23, all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For the all gods of the nations. Now look at this. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Ascribe. To the Lord, all you families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory do His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. 
Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let them say it, generations united, the Lord reigns this morning. The Lord reigns. Let the sea resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let the trees of the forest sing. Let them sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Come on, church. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. He says, cry out. What do we cry out? Save us, O God our Savior. Gather us, deliver us, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. Come on, in this house this morning, in this house this morning, in your household this morning, the common thread throughout David's life, beyond warrior, beyond the mistakes, beyond anything else, the common thread is that he's a worshiper. He's a worshiper. Quick to repent. Quick to acknowledge his wrongdoing. Quick to acknowledge God in everything. But you have to understand that David was a foreshadowing of what was to come. What he was doing with the Ark of the Covenant is showing us a picture 3,000 years ago of what was going to happen 2,000 years ago. What was going to happen when Jesus died on the cross, when he said with his last breath, it is finished, and the veil, the big four-inch curtain in the temple that was 20-something feet tall was torn, not from the bottom to the top, because like men could do it, but from the top to the bottom. Opening access once again to God. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You don't have to go to a priest You don't have to go to a preacher. You don't have to go to a confessional. You don't have to go to an altar. Anywhere you are, God is. If you make your bed in hell, God is with you. If there's a table prepared for you in the presence of your enemies, God is there. And His rod and His staff, they bring comfort to you. It doesn't matter what you're going through this morning. It doesn't matter if everything in your life is because of bad decisions. It doesn't matter everything in your life, every struggle in your life is because of what people have done to you. It doesn't matter if it's because you've been obedient to God. The struggles are the struggles. But the thing that you and I have to understand is this, that what must define every child of God beyond anything else, beyond the struggle, is our worship. It must define us. It must define us. And it can't be this little menial thing that we do once a day or once a week or once every two or three weeks we come to church on a Sunday the sad thing about it is that David did all this showing people a new way and when the temple was built they went back to the old way Instead of the ark being open to the public, it was put into a a room. It was barricaded off, and then once again, only the priest could get there. Oh, everybody's everybody's real concerned about the temple being rebuilt in Israel and all this kind of stuff. The temple's been rebuilt. Every time Jesus Christ saves somebody, the temple's being rebuilt. (laughs) This is the temple of God. This is the temple of God. This is the temple of God, and worship is capable. We are capable of worship 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Worship will change you. Extravagant worship. This is what David did. Now, we're not going to go to the extreme that David went this morning, okay? David took off his robe, danced around in his underwear. This do not do. Do not take off your clothes. But you can worship extravagantly. For some of you, you have no tradition that that, that, that you can wrap your head around this morning. You say, I wasn't raised in this. This is a little bit weird. They're They're making noise in church. 
People are standing up. They're raising their hands. They're clapping. They're sounding. They're, they're shouting. They're singing. They're, the church is supposed to be quiet. We've got to keep our head down because God will zap us if we pick our head up. Oh, we can't show emotion in church. We can't show emotion because, because emotion is a work of the... Listen to me. When God saves you, He saves all of you. And when He says you love the Lord your God, you love Him with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength, and that includes your emotions. So the extravagance of worship, when we worship extravagantly, when we understand that, that extravagant worship will lift us, it will get our eyes off ourself and our issues. Oh, I just got too much hell going on in my life. Then you're worshiping hell. Some of you, listen to me today, and you know I love you, okay? But I got to say this. Some of you are so satisfied in your pain that you're wearing it as a security blanket. And it's squelching your worship. I'm not going to worship God. God never done anything for me. You're breathing, aren't you? You woke up this morning, didn't you? Every person in this room, every person within the sound of my voice, every person that's going to see this on video over the next few weeks, I can promise you, you got something to worship God about. It lifts us. Remember Paul's tormenting spirit? When David would play and sing and they would begin to worship, the spirit would leave. You need some peace this morning? Step out of what's normal, what's comfortable, and begin to worship God extravagantly. Extravagant worship breaks chains. It breaks chains off of us. Stuff falls off of us when we begin to worship God. We talked about Paul and Silas a few weeks ago. Midnight, in prison, with shackles and chains, they're worshiping God. Would that have happened if they hadn't been in worship? No. They would have been satisfied and content in their shackles and chains. All wound, gloom, despair, and agony on me, right off hee-haw. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. And you can wallow in that all you want to. But I'm telling you this morning that when you move out of what is normal into a place of extravagant worship, chains begin to fall off of you. Strongholds in your life begin to be demolished. Why? Because you're exalting the name of the Lord. You go back and read that passage in 1 Chronicles 16, and you see that David is instructing them how to worship. It is about lifting God up, that His love endures forever, that God is great, and He is greatly to be praised, that the trees of the forest are going to sing, that the seas begin to resound with praise unto God. And He's told us this in Scripture, that if the living won't praise me, then I'll, I'll make sure that the tombstones do. I thought that was about the rocks. It is about the rocks, but it's not about a pebble. Where Jesus said that is a 3,000-year-old cemetery on the slopes of, outside of Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives. And when I stood there that day and realized that this is the place that Jesus said, if these don't praise me, then the rocks will cry out. The only rock on that hillside is graves. So what was he really saying there that morning? Listen to me. If the living won't praise me, the dead will rise up and they will. Listen to me this morning, Generations United. In this house today, in this house today, God wants to be enthroned in your praise. God wants to be enthroned in the praise of His people. Psalm 22, 3 says that. God is enthroned in the praise of His people. God can be bigger than your problems. God can be bigger than your struggles. Your struggles do not have to define you. You can be defined by your worship of the Almighty Creator of the universe. But it's going to mean that you've got to step out of what is normal. You've got to step away from what is comfortable. And I'm calling you this morning to, from this church, from this pulpit today, I'm calling you to choose to worship today. Let your life be defined by the way you worship God. May you worship God constantly. May you worship God consistently. But above everything else, may Generations United Church worship God extravagantly.